Edge AI is the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning on Edge devices as opposed to relying on cloud services. Edge AI and Edge computing in general help to limit bandwidth usage, reduce latency, lower energy consumption, enhance reliability, and ensure user privacy. Knowing which device to use can be confusing, so let's go through some potential use cases, factors to keep in mind, and which types of processors are the best fit for different AI tasks. The first and most important thing you need to figure out is your use case. What problem are you trying to solve? Let's review some popular use case categories, as these will affect your processing needs. The first is time series data. This consists of data captured from one or more sensors over a period of time. For example, here is a plot of me moving an accelerometer up and down. It shows the motion of some object. Maybe we want to classify different movements of, say, a shipping container to look for anomalies in order to watch for damaged items. In time series data, the sample rate is the amount of time between sampling points, and it is usually measured in hertz, or samples per second. We care about this number because a higher sample rate means an increase in the amount of data being generated. In turn, this means that we usually need more computing power to keep up with all that data in a timely fashion. In addition to monitoring and classifying motion, other common time series sensors include temperature, flow rate, and electrocardiography for measuring heartbeats. Audio is also incredibly useful, as it allows us to identify certain sounds or words, as well as look for anomalies in mechanical equipment. You would use a microphone, much like the one I'm talking to, to capture audio data. Now, let's look at common sample rates for these various data collection activities. If you're looking at temperature to, say, monitor weather, you might only sample once per second or maybe once per hour. That gives a sampling rate of something in the 0 0.0003 to 1 hertz range. Measuring fluid flow rates, something in the 1 to 1000 hertz range, is often good enough. Many heart rate monitors work in the 50 to 1000 hertz range. Motion is similar, starting at about 50 but can go up to 4000 hertz for high precision analysis. Finally, audio, especially speech and music, requires a much higher sample rate, often in the 10 to 200,000 hertz range. Keep these values in mind when we talk about different processing devices. Perhaps you want to work with images and video. Cameras are another incredibly popular sensor type, as they give our AI devices sight. For example, we might do image classification, say figuring out if an image is of a dog or a cat. We can also do object detection, which is where we try to identify different types of objects in an image and where they are located. Computer vision is extremely popular and incredibly useful, but it is also very computationally expensive, as it takes a lot of power to process images. There are, of course, many other use cases of Edge AI, but these are some of the more popular ones right now. Something else you want to consider is what kind of interface the device should have. Do you need to have a user interface for people to interact with? Is it something that could run on existing hardware, like a laptop or a smartphone? Or maybe it's a small, self-contained sensor that you need to install in a remote location. What kind of sensors should it have? Smartphones come equipped with loads of sensors, like microphones, cameras, and accelerometers. But if you are developing your own IoT device, you might have to add sensors yourself. Or maybe you need the computing power of a larger system, so you decide to stream data back to a local or cloud server for processing. If you are streaming data, or even want to send notifications, you'll need some kind of connectivity on your device. That might be something like 5G, Wi-Fi, or Bluetooth. Next, you have to take power constraints into account. If you need to run your device for 10 years off of a battery, then power consumption is going to be a big concern. On the other hand, if you can guarantee that your device is always plugged into a wall, then you don't necessarily need to optimize for energy usage. But do keep in mind that generally low power devices mean you can often save money on your electric bill. 
Also, wireless transmission often consumes a large amount of energy compared to processing data directly on the device itself. In many cases, you can ditch the constant connection or only use it sparingly to save energy. You should also consider the form factor of your device. Maybe you have an entire room or desk to spare for a server to do your processing, but that's not feasible for every use case. You might want the device to be wearable or fit in a user's pocket. Alternatively, you might need to attach the device to existing machinery, so keep the footprint and size of your hardware in mind. Next is the operating environment. If you can run your Edge AI model in a temperature-controlled server room, that's great, but you might not always have that luxury. For example, maybe your device needs to be installed outdoors on electrical transmission towers or on vehicles, which often proves to be a harsher environment than just outdoors. Or maybe it will go to space, which is an even harsher environment. It's best to keep environmental factors in mind when choosing your hardware. Some devices work better in climate-controlled spaces, while others are designed for extreme conditions. Another thing to consider is code portability. This refers to the ability to write software that can run across different hardware and operating systems, which applies to phones as well. Low-power IoT devices are often programmed in lower-level languages like C or C++ and rely on proprietary libraries to talk to the hardware. That makes writing portable code that can run on different device architectures a little more difficult. Generally, writing portable code means using high-level languages or libraries that incur some processing overhead, thus requiring a more powerful processor. In turn, this usually means a larger device and more energy consumption. On the other hand, you have the option of creating code that is optimized for your device, but you give up some level of portability by doing so. Also, optimizing your software usually requires longer development time and effort, so keep these trade-offs in mind when choosing your Edge AI platform. Finally, when putting together an Edge AI solution, you have the option of buying one or more components versus building the system from scratch. I like to call this the do-it-yourself or DIY approach. Let's take a look at the advantages and disadvantages of each approach. When you buy systems or components, it often saves you time and money on engineering, as the solution is ready-made for your needs. Off-the-shelf components are often easier to use, as you don't need to create the interface or documentation yourself. However, building the systems yourself offers a much greater degree of customization. This is often the key reason teams choose to DIY. Note that buying off-the-shelf parts usually means higher per-unit costs, as most third-party vendors have overhead and want to make a profit. That being said, building something yourself often incurs hidden expenses, such as underestimating effort or miscalculating the support and maintenance costs. If you are building a device for sale, it often requires expensive compliance testing. This includes getting certifications from organizations like UL, CE, or the FCC. In most cases, buying devices from a third-party vendor means that such certifications will already be completed. As a result, off-the-shelf is often cheaper if you only need a few end devices, but it might be more cost-effective to build your own if you plan to make hundreds or thousands of devices. Finally, off-the-shelf usually means you have access to vendor support, but it means you are reliant on that vendor for your solution. Going DIY means you can survive if the vendor disappears or stops supporting your item. With all these factors in mind, let's weigh our options for what kind of hardware might work best for different use cases. We'll start with low-end microcontrollers. A microcontroller is a self-contained processing unit and memory on a single chip. It's like a tiny computer, but it has very limited compute power. They are often cost-effective and consume little power. Most of the time, they are designed to accomplish one or just a few tasks, such as data collection from sensors, controlling motors, or communicating with other devices. They usually have little or no user interface, as they are meant to be embedded in other systems. You likely interact with these kinds of microcontrollers on a daily basis. For example, you can find them controlling your microwave oven, making the TV remote work, and controlling various smart appliances. You'll often see the term microcontroller abbreviated as MCU, which stands for microcontroller unit. 
you can find them with clock speeds in the range of 10 to around 100 megahertz. The biggest limitation is often the size of their random access memory, or RAM. While your computer might have a few gigabytes of RAM, these low-power devices often have only a few kilobytes. Most of these low-end microcontrollers were not designed for machine learning applications, but we can still use them to run some simple ML algorithms. For example, you will find that they are perfectly capable of performing classification and anomaly detection on many time series data streams we saw earlier. That includes data such as temperature, flow rate, heart rate, and motion. They can also handle basic audio functions such as keyword spotting. However, the lack of memory and low clock speed often means they cannot handle image processing very well or at all. Next, we have the larger, more powerful microcontrollers. Similar to their low-power cousins, they are like tiny, self-contained computers. They offer more power, but they are usually limited to running just one or a few tasks. You can find them performing such tasks as running the software on your smartwatch, controlling various aspects of modern car engines, and operating complex industrial robots. The boundary between low- and high-end MCUs can be blurry, but generally more powerful MCUs run with clock speeds in the range of a few hundred megahertz. They also have more RAM, often up to a few megabytes. Because of this extra raw power, they can do everything the low-end microcontrollers can do with the added benefit of working with more data. This includes some image processing tasks, like image classification. However, most still struggle with basic object detection, as the models are often simply too large. Microprocessors, also known as microprocessor units, or MPUs, are even more powerful and often more expensive. Unlike microcontrollers, they usually do not have things like system memory built into the chip. As a result, external components like RAM cards and hard drives are often used to make up a full computing system. When you think of a computer, that often includes an MPU and all the components needed to make it run. A couple of common examples are your laptop and your smartphone. Most computing devices with MPUs are designed to be general purpose, which means they can handle a wide variety of tasks like browsing the internet, editing photos, and streaming videos. Let's take a moment to clear up some possibly confusing terminology. You might have heard the term Central Processing Unit, or CPU. This describes the hardware built for executing instructions or performing math operations in a computing device. A microprocessor unit is the integrated circuit, or chip, that contains one or more CPUs and the supporting electronics required for them to work. They are usually built for general purpose computing. A microcontroller unit, like the microprocessor, also describes the actual chip, with at least one CPU. However, unlike microprocessors, MCUs almost always have other components, like memory and communication hardware built into the chip itself. They are also usually smaller, cheaper, and designed for just one or a few tasks. As I mentioned, MPUs are built for handling a variety of tasks. They also often run faster than their microcontroller counterparts, with clock speeds that range from 500 megahertz into single-digit gigahertz. Because they can take advantage of external memory, you often find such general-purpose computing systems with anywhere from 100 megabytes to 100 gigabytes. Keep in mind that these are just estimates as of 2024. Computing specs continue to evolve and grow over time. Because of this raw power, most MPUs can easily handle all of our Edge AI example use cases, including time series data, audio, image classification, and object detection. Because MPUs are built for general purpose applications, they are not optimized for machine learning. ML operations usually involve a lot of matrix adding and multiplication. There is another popular computing component that, while not explicitly built for machine learning, actually performs these operations quite well. And that is the Graphics Processing Unit, or GPU. GPUs are chips, just like MPUs, that are often put into modular graphics cards, or built into the motherboards of smaller devices like smartphones. 
Originally, GPUs were designed to efficiently render images, videos, and video game graphics so that the MPU could focus on other tasks. It turns out, GPUs are good for other things too. Rendering graphics involves a lot of matrix math, which is really what GPUs are optimized for. In recent years, they've been used to mine cryptocurrency and run complex machine learning algorithms, both of which require heavy matrix operations. GPUs are optimized for performing parallel computations, which is how they can work with matrices so well. They often run slightly slower and with a little less RAM than MPUs, but those parallel operations more than make up for that loss. Because they are so good at matrix math, they perform well on nearly any edge AI task. Most cloud machine learning is done with large arrays of GPUs working together, which means GPUs can be used for even more complex AI tasks, like training and running large language models. And that brings us to the final piece of hardware that we will examine. Companies are beginning to design and manufacture specialized machine learning hardware. This is the Google Tensor Processing Unit, or TPU. It is an example of a Neural Processing Unit, or NPU. These are integrated circuits that have been optimized for machine learning operations, specifically neural networks. They are often used for both training as well as inference, and they come in a wide variety of shapes and sizes. They can be built into the same chip as a microcontroller, or they might be a separate chip, like on this sentient TinyML board. Or you can get large boards the size of graphics cards that contain several NPUs used for handling large computing loads. NPUs have a range of possible performance characteristics, and like GPUs, they are often found with one or more CPU coprocessors. That can be an MCU or an MPU to handle the general computing needs. Because neural processing units are so optimized for machine learning, even the smaller edge devices can handle most of our edge AI tasks with ease, and they can do so in an energy efficient manner. In many cases, you will often find these different components working together in a single device. For example, your smartphone likely has separate microcontrollers for managing power and network activity, a multi-core microprocessor for running applications, and a graphics processor for rendering videos and graphics. Newer smartphones even include specialized ML chips or NPUs for handling things like face detection and keyword spotting. You might also come across the term system on a chip, or SOC. This is a broad term that essentially refers to any integrated circuit that combines several computing components onto a single chip. You could make the argument that a microcontroller is an SOC since it contains a CPU and memory. But usually, SOC refers to chips that contain other processing units. For example, you might have an SOC with a high-end microcontroller and a Wi-Fi controller in the same package. It might also have a low-power microcontroller to manage, say, the power systems. And it likely has some on-chip RAM. More recently, you'll find some SOCs that have built-in neural processing units. Asking the right questions can help you better understand if Edge AI is the right tool for the job and how to choose the best hardware to meet your needs. There are lots of factors to consider, but I hope this has helped give you a good start. In the next video, we will look at the Edge AI lifecycle, how you collect data, analyze that data, train a model, and then deploy it to an Edge device.